welcome, welcome, welcome to the very first session, the real kickoff of the linguistics career launch. And this session is going to be about networking for introverts. Are you one? I am. And I'm going to share with you some tips over the years that I have learned about and that I now teach in my courses at Georgetown University. This is, as we mentioned earlier, part of a cadence of career management sessions that are going to be held over the course of the next two weeks. So we have this one today. This will be followed as if you are in the job search process by creating and tailoring an effective resume, learning how to put together bullet points, learning where you can find the language to put in those bullet points in your resume and how you can tailor it to specific jobs and specific sectors. We'll work on that together. We're also going to engage in a series of information sessions about informational interviewing. This is what I consider part of networking, but it's a specific genre, a named genre, that is going to be one of your best career research tools. And we'll cover that. And it'll also be covered intently in Anna Marie Truster's class. We're going to talk also about leveraging LinkedIn, and we can be using this throughout. You can be using it today while I'm talking, looking at people who are in this session with you and starting to connect with people. And later on, we'll talk about jobs, offers, benefits, and salary. I'm Alex Johnston. I'm going to be with you today and before these other sessions to let you know who I am. I am a faculty instructor. I'm an associate professor of practice at Georgetown University. And for the past six years, I've taught a class exactly on these topics called Career Management for Linguists. And that's an actual class for credit. It's a semester long class that linguists who are both in graduate and undergraduate degree programs at Georgetown can take in order to get intense career management information and do all the practical work of career management from all of these topics that we'll be covering in our sessions together and then working on activities and practice like you'll get if you select to take Anna Marie Truster's class on career discernment. I love this class. It's the class I would have wanted. And these sessions are what I would have wanted when I was starting out my career. I didn't have it. So I had to spend 20 years trying to figure it out, trying to research myself and, and then actually becoming a career coach and a trainer and a professional development instructor. And that's what I've done outside of my academic career for most of my life. I've been a global talent development consultant for over 15 years. And I deliver professional development training to corporate government, nonprofit, and higher ed clients. And I never would have thought when I was a younger person studying linguistics in undergrad and grad school that the shy, shy introvert me would have become a teacher, a trainer, somebody who has to engage in all of these social interactions for a living and for my job and for my life. So I want to talk about some ways that you can work with your personality and your preferences and your tendencies and make networking, that is connecting with people, work for you and build on strengths you already have. Because it's my belief that anybody can do this. There are so many different ways of engaging in networking, basically just reaching out to people. What are our goals for this session? We are going to reframe networking and small talk. Small talk also gets a bad rap. So we're gonna reframe that and talk about how you can prep for small talk. I'm gonna present five tools for authentic networking and hopefully make networking fun. I mean, this should be one of the goals, not to consider this to be a burden or something that causes anxiety or that feeling in your stomach, like you're just so concerned about a situation. Wanna try and build on your strengths and make it fun. And I know though, I know my audience and from six years of teaching this and interacting with people, a common reaction to networking is not like, oh, it's going to be so much fun. I can't wait. It's more like, hmm, no, this is not me. No, a little bit of resistance to identify with this recalcitrant child. It's, it's fine to have these feelings about networking. A lot of people view it as something like, transactional, extractive, fake, a lot of things that we don't identify with or want to be. 
So we have these perceptions of networking as, as having those qualities. And there's a bit of resistance to, to being fake, <laughs> to, to being transactional or extractive with people. And that's, that's not something we, we want to be or want to engage in in the world. But we know that networking, I'm still going to use quotes for this until we get to the next part of our talk, but networking is something that that we need to do. We need to build connections with people. We need to reach out and learn about the world. And it's an essential part of the career management cycle, which is this circle you see that is labeled, you know, in a clockwise pattern of researching, developing, and applying. And the research of career management is part of learning what's out there, learning who's out there, learning what I can do, learning what's my match with the world, what engages my passions and interests and skills, and where can I do it and can I be paid for it? And so a lot of our career management over our life cycle is just researching and learning. And part of that is people, using people as data, <laughs> as, as resources we can learn from. And we also engage in developing aspects of genres associated with finding a job and developing our career. We, we build patterns for small talk. We build patterns of interaction. We build genres such as informational interviewing and the genre of job application interviews. We develop resumes. We develop all of these aspects of our portfolio that we can then use in the active part of applying. And that's the third part of the cycles when we apply to a job or we're in an active uh, search for a new position. So we know people have to network. And the thing is the people who most benefit from networking are the most junior people. So the youngest in age and the earliest in stage of their careers. And that's unfortunate because that's when you really need to, to get out there and learn from people and start building your community. It's people who are more seasoned, experienced, and later on in their career who are the ones who engage in this most, most naturally because it's become a habit that they've developed over time. So I talked about reframing networking. Why? We got to change our mindset. We have to shift that mindset. And reframing in general is a tool for changing your perspective. And when you change your perspective, you hopefully have new and different thoughts about that activity that you're engaging in. Those new thoughts can lead to new and different actions, which can, which can lead to new ways of being in the world and connecting with people. So the first rule of networking is don't call it networking. If you don't like that word, if it brings up poor associations of extraction and of being fake, forget it, forget that word. We wanna talk about things that you already love and enjoy and do in your life and build from there. So in fact, networking is a social good. It's a good thing to do for yourself and for others. So let's talk about that. Networking is a way to connect with others who have shared interests. And this is an authentic way to reach out to people. You share a love of linguistics. You share a disciplinary area, such as discourse analysis or, or institutional gatekeeping encounters. You find somebody who likes the same thing. You have a common talk topic to connect about and to go further with. That's great. That is authentic. Networking or reaching out to people gives you the potential for making a new friend or a new colleague. You never know who is going to be in the room with you in this very room right here, who might be your next friend, your next colleague, who might be a collaborator on a project, who might be part of your job squad, as I might call it. Some part of this, this club, this connected circle of people who are getting through this period of time where you're figuring out next steps. So think of all of the stories held by people in this very room and think about how you can get to know them and bring them into your circle and your community. Networking can be a social good for people who are connected to you. One of the ways that 
networking can work for introverts is to take that focus off of yourself and stop thinking of networking as something that just benefits you. It's just for you to learn something, to find out about an area of work or to learn about open positions or think about it as something I can do for others. If you have a friend who's looking for a job in, you know, lexicography, people still do, you know, you can say, oh, I know somebody who's a lex lexicographer. Let me introduce you to them. Let me send an email. Let me send a LinkedIn message to connect you to. You can advocate for your friends. You can use your own experiences and your, and your own resources to help others. And you can also help advocate for issues that you care about. So maybe language access is something of deep interest for you because you view it as a way for marginalized communities to gain access to, to benefits offered by the government, to voting information. That kind of advocating on behalf of a community that you belong to is something that can help you move outside of yourself, to reach out to people who can help you in that shared goal of increasing language access at local, state, or federal government. So you can advocate for others and for issues. And it's a way to give back and help others who have also helped you. A lot of us love learning and research. We might think of ourselves as lifelong learners because you know we're, we're here learning about language and attending to minute aspects of language as you know, structure and function and social interaction. We, we love to, to research these things. So consider turning that research lens on yourself and use the research in search of your career goal, in search of your next steps. It's your chance to be so curious about people and to explore what's out there just by asking questions of people who are doing something different from you. So engage and indulge in that sense of curiosity about the world and talk to people about what they do. Use the chat here in this room, use the spreadsheet that we've collected from that informational form about who's here to scan it and to start reaching out to people who are here at this LCL bootcamp and you know, send, them, send them a message on their platform of choice. This is why we put this spreadsheet together to give you that jumpstart in reaching out to people. You'll get to learn so many new stories and so about so many different aspects of linguistics and about what people are already doing as professionals working in industry, working in government, working in nonprofit organizations. It's a cornucopia, a buffet of, of tempting choices uh, when you look at that spreadsheet and see who's here and when you start reaching out and hearing other people's stories. Think of networking too as investing in my future. It's something that you, you invest in right now, maybe when you don't necessarily need a job immediately or when you aren't actively looking for something, but as a habit to build, it's a way of investing in yourself. It's the next step in your journey. It can be a way to create luck. And you know, what do I mean by that? I mentioned, I mentioned in the in the chat that I had a, a story about O'Hare, and there was a question like, oh, was it about delays? I'm one of the rare people who actually likes flying through O'Hare. Uh, that that can be fighting words, you know for people who've had, who've had to overnight there, but I truly, I love that airport. I tend to meet a lot of interesting people in that airport. And one time I was having dinner at one of my favorite places there, Tortas Frontera, getting a mango lime agua fresca and enjoying that, very crowded, seat next to me at the bar. And this woman asked if she could put her stuff down and sit next to me, like share the space. I said, absolutely, of course. And I decided to open my mouth 20 years ago. Maybe I wouldn't have done that, but just this, she had an open look about her and said, are you on your way home? Are you going somewhere? A typical kind of airport conversation question. And she said, oh, I've just been at a conference. And I said, oh, me too. And we started talking and she found out I was at a linguistics conference. And she said, linguistics? I actually work with linguists. And I was like, oh, you do? This is amazing. Tell me about the linguists you work with. 
And it turned out that she was a director in a large healthcare and a healthcare company that specializes in insights for business to business uh, operations. And she was engaged in a conference talking about her work in that's in the healthcare and pharmaceutical space. And she hires linguists to work in subsidiaries of this company. And she was telling me, oh, do you know so-and-so? I was like, yes, one of my favorite linguists. We had people in common. And she told me then about a new initiative that she was building, a way to develop an interdisciplinary space within her organization that would bring together social scientists of all kinds, psycho psychologists, sociologists, linguists, to work on issues of communication between healthcare providers and patients. And this was such a great common interest to explore because I'm always looking for people to connect my own students to. And I'm always trying to learn about new spaces of work, new, new avenues of work that I don't know about, new initiatives. So this is a lovely chance that came from simply taking the, the choice to open my mouth and to engage with the woman next to me. And I call that creating my luck because I then later kept connecting with this woman and kept, and she would think of me when she had a position that I would forward then to my students. And we've sort of maintained this, this relationship. It's, it's a way to open up avenues of opportunity that you never would have had if you didn't choose to ask that question, to make that move, to say hello. And a lot of people hear stories like these and say, well, you know, I never sit next to that kind of person on an airplane. I never run into that person waiting in line at the post office. And yet, maybe you have, but you just didn't know. Maybe it's that one time where you say yes, or you open your mouth and ask that question, where you learn a story and you learn to build a, a connection of co-membership. So you never know. These opportunities come all the time, though. So never feel bad if you don't choose to say yes or choose to make small talk with people, but know that there are remarkable potentials that can open up if you choose to do so. I have a student who calls this futuring my life. I love this term. What she means by this is that when she networks, it's like she's imagining all these possible futures the future that comes from just taking that chance to talk with someone or to go more in depth, to learn about a person's work and what they do every day and learn about their position, their organization, their space. This is called informational interviewing and we'll talk about that later, but it's a chance to imagine potential futures. So I think that's a wonderful way to talk about networking as futuring and think about what could come of this. A lot of the times when we have these images of networking, something like this comes to mind. And maybe this kind of strikes fear into your heart or makes your stomach sink. Like, oh, there are people looking professional and they're in groups and I hate this. There's too many people, there's too much going on. This is not ideal. But networking or you know, meeting up with people often just looks like this. Uh, a department <laughs> career mixer that I held this past spring. So with students and with career linguists, like the ones who are going to talk to you throughout the program. In fact, some of them are in this picture, centered around food and drink. And linguists, social scientists, we, we know these people. We know that they are open and for the most part, for the most part, open and friendly. So we can take chances with them. And we know that we can come, we can engage in networking when we're into a small group project, when we're co-working together, really any kind of social situation can turn into this situation where you learn more about others and you simply just you know, talk about hobbies, talk about work, talk about careers. Once you bring up the topic of career conversations, it could become very fruitful. Networking is going to look like this during our program together. We're going to be on gather just like this. And this mimics, mimics kind of real life 
uh, in-person networking situations where you kind of join groups in these private places. And sometimes you take time for yourself <laughs> by the wall. And that's fine. That's fine to regroup. And I did that in a recent career mixer. <laughs> so we all need to recharge at certain points. It is perfectly fine to step away, whether it's in person or virtually and, you know, sit by that wall for a while and figure out what's my next move? Who would I like to engage with next? But then just take that opportunity to go into a different private space or go find somebody else who's on their own and say hello. Networking should not be transactional. It should not be extracted. In fact, the best way to think about it is as a mutually beneficial social interaction. And that's where a lot of introverts have, have strength because they think of others. And through thinking of others, they take the focus off of themselves. So a lot of students say to me, I don't have anything to, to give other people. I'm bothering other people when I do this. I'm like, no, please change your mindset about that. You always have something to give other people. You can always give your time. The fact that you're spending time with somebody shows care. It shows that you're, you're there, you're co-present in some way. And you can show through your engaged listenership that you're really attending to what people say, that you're not just hustling. Here's my card, here's my contact, let me ping you. That you're truly listening to others. Anybody can give engaged listenership. You also have far more knowledge of other people and resources than you would think. You, it's normalized for you because it's yours and you, you, but for other people, it can be new, it can be exciting, it can be different. You have experience and expertise no matter where you are in age or stage of career. And that can be something that enlightens other people. You also have a secret weapon of thoughtful follow-up so that if as an introvert or someone who is not improvisational in the moment or forgets in the moment something that they wanted to say can always follow up. And in this day and age of finding people on LinkedIn or through other platforms, this is where you can excel. You can excel in follow-up. And we'll talk a bit about that in a minute because we're gonna to get to preparation. You can prepare and for all virtual asynchronous or face-to-face -face interactions. And we'll focus on some ways you can do that. Starting with setting intentions, if you can, who might you like to connect with? So for our situation here, try to read that spreadsheet and find some people you wanna to talk to. Research people and organizations, do some background work online. While you're at it, update your own digital presence, your own LinkedIn or your own feed of some social media platform and make sure that that's up to date because people will want to look you up as well. And it's not stalking. This is professional. <laughs> this is just getting information professionally. And work on preparing just a small elevator pitch or small talk that's geared to that context and that audience. Make some notes. I'm gonna go over this really fast, but you have these slides and my cat can vouch. You need to make notes and prep for these kinds of interactions. Just try to answer some questions. What am I looking for? What am I curious about? Put down bullet points about jobs or positions you might be interested in and try to get that into a couple of sentences that you can tell people when you meet them. Create that sample pattern of a pitch. And you'll be working on this more if you go to a class with Dr. Anna Marie Truster. You can read this later, but figure out how this can work for you. Use words that are, are good for you. And that makes sense. And make sure to edit and tailor these small pitches or small on-ramps to interaction in the moment. And I've provided some samples you can look at later. And change to make your own. Let's talk about small talk though. Let's get into it. You might have this reaction, this cat leaping away because a lot of people don't like small talk. For later listening, I'd love for you to listen to this podcast by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gohn. I assign this every year to my students because it has some of the best information about small talk and what it is. And you can look at these subjects. But 
why is small talk such a big deal? It is so interactionally multifunctional. We use it for rapport building, for seeking co-membership, hashtag Erickson and Schultz. We use it to build connections. And we want to suss out or get a sense of other people's perspectives, personality, or emotional states. So when you talk about the weather, it's not really talking about the weather. We're talking vibes. You're getting vibes from people. And you're seeing where you can connect. Where, do, where are your vibes similar? And what could you potentially create as a, as a connection? And it's this basis for something else to happen once commonality is established. It's that on-ramp on to the road of interaction. And, you know, sometimes that on-ramp goes to a, a dead end and that's fine. Maybe it's time or occasion limited. It doesn't go beyond in that moment. That's all right. But sometimes this interaction leads to something else. If there are vibes, if there's co-membership, and if there's topics that spark authentic connections. So here's how to hack it. There's often a question behind the question. Go beyond the message level. Look at the intent. So that question we all get, how many languages do you speak? As a linguist, we hear it all the time. It's not necessarily about you enumerating the languages that you speak and to what degree of fluency, which we often try to do, right? That's what we, how we answer that. Don't, don't take it literally. Think about the intention. For Gretchen McCulloch, it just means to her, tell me a thing about a language. Give me something interesting about a language, any language. This is just a way to respond to that intent of starting an interaction. My translation of this question is, tell me something about language that's relevant to me. So if I'm, if I'm talking to a business executive, I'm like, email, right? I've done a job analyzing email. Do you know what are some steps to creating better emails? Who knows? Try to say something that's relevant to that person. How's the dissertation going? There's often a question behind that. It's like, how is your mental state? Are you okay these days? Continuing on, talk about the occasion or the location, anything about the space you're sharing or what's going on. Like how's LCL going for you so far? What's up with cohorts, am I right? Do you understand cohorts now? I'm still wondering. I hope you understand them. You just had a cohort meeting. Is this your first time with Gather? I still don't know how to locate someone on the map. Do you know how? Rely on your, your fellow boot camp registrants and, and ask them questions and share in the discoveries of this experience together. Have you found the space station? Ooh, that's something to hunt for. And then finally, ask open-ended questions. In English, these are the WH questions that presume content in the answer. And these are in contrast to yes, no questions that start with do, have, or be. Are you a student? Ooh, there are a couple of pitfalls here. First of all, you're presuming something about somebody's identity. Leave this open-ended and change it from a choice question of yes, no to how's your conference so far? This is something you can ask everybody. Do you come here often? That's a choice question that you might hear. Instead of that, how about what do you like about this conference or this airport bar that I just met you at? Or why did you come here? How did you hear about it? What do you hope to get out of it? Whatever it is, be authentic. This is one of your strengths as an introvert. Try to be generally positive, generally open in that those first moments, if you can, use your own content questions to draw others out. Reframe that small talk. And then your secret weapon of following up. If you've engaged with someone and told them, oh, there's an article I really hope you read, or there's this person that you have to talk to about language access. Somebody who works in local government, they do such a great job. You have to meet them. I'll connect you. Keep your word. Make sure in some follow-up and some other channel of communication that you send that article, that you send that introductory message. Sometimes you, you miss a chance to meet somebody in a certain occasion. So you always have the opportunity to follow up later. You can reconnect on LinkedIn or other platforms. Follow up, easy patterns. You can turn some seeming mistakes into strengths. So sometimes you go to a conference or an event like this and you think 
you know, I really need to talk to so-and-so and the time goes by and either your anxiety is ramped up or you just don't get to it. That's okay. Follow-up is your friend. Send a message on a platform and say, great meeting you. If you did meet them, I enjoyed your panel if you did. And if you missed them, I saw you and meant to reach out. I saw in your fun facts that you have an interest in Kintsugi and that caught my attention. How'd that come about? Okay, this was my fun fact. You'll find that on the spreadsheet. What's the deal with Kintsugi, you ask? Have you ever broken a favorite plate or a ceramic? Happens all the time in my house, I have teenagers. Kintsugi is a Japanese craft that has been around for hundreds of years and it's a method of repair. And not only repairing a broken ceramic or a chipped object, but a way of actually showing off that repair by enhancing it with gold. So I sometimes think of conversations and the ongoing flow of interaction as never ending opportunities to repair and to reach out and to add layers of history to your interaction. So when you look back and you see how you've repaired an object and you see this beautiful line of gold, you can think that's, that's another aspect of this object's history. This is how I added to it. This is how I made something that, that seemed imperfect into something better, how I kept at it. There's, there's a lot in this metaphor here that I'm still fleshing out, but I, I love to think about never ending opportunities to, to reach back, to reconnect and to say, or do something that you meant to. So these five tools are for you to practice during our time together. And then the bonus is to focus more on informational interviewing, which is going to really drill down on how you can use networking as a way to research in depth aspects of the next steps of your, of your career journey as you look at positions, organizations, and career pathways of all types all diverse pathways that are out there. And I'd love for you to schedule these kinds of things out. Try to schedule it like you would a meeting. Try to put this on your calendar. And as Anna Marie Truster would say, if you do an informational interview a week, at the end of a year, you have 50 aspects of, of data gathering and 50 new people that you've been talking to more in depth. So try doing that. And remember, just take those opportunities to engage, to say yes, to open your mouth or send that email, send that connection. And I'll now stop sharing. And if you want to continue on in these slides, there are further tips, but I would love to just take some questions here and find out from you if you have questions about connecting, networking, how to do it. Oh, and I'm seeing an interesting comment in the chat. As an introvert, networking is actually more fun for me than socializing at a party because I know I'm interested in the person I'm talking to or have things in common with before I meet them. And yeah, like that makes use of your, your investment in preparation. It gives you that time to, to research someone, to look at their, their digital presence, to find out commonalities. LinkedIn makes that so easy and to use that as a jumping off point. And I'll go to Crystal, please unmute and talk to me. Hi, uh, thank you for this great talk. I wanted to ask, um, so I know a lot of networking relies on, you know, being to read body language and recognizing people's faces and voices. What do you do if, you know, you either struggle with that or you might have like a physical disability that prevents you from doing that sort of thing. Maybe you're deaf or you're, you know, you're blind. What do you do when you struggle with getting this kind of information when you can't? Thank you so much for bringing up accessibility and networking. So for, I have a couple of initial answers to this and let's continue the conversation also making use of people who are in the room. But a couple ways to think about this is there are so many multiple channels of communication that you can make use of. So we, we now have access to so many ways to interact online. So for, for people who are 
deaf and communicate in in English text, this is a great way to reach out to people. If you're in a situation like gather, that's a way that you can indicate on your gather handle that you're that you're deaf. You can put in a subheading that I prefer to communicate by text. Um, and you can even put an emoji next to your name. Um, some people use a pencil, like I want to text, I want to chat that way. So you can indicate in a virtual environment where you're communicate, where you have the option to communicate through written word, what your preferences are. This can also be done in a face-to-face -face situation. Some of these classical networking situations when you're in a large group or a large room. And people I know who have handled those situations meta-communicate a lot. So they let people know very soon, you know, I'm deaf, I'm hard of hearing, can we text, can we write, and kind of shift the mode of interaction to a different medium. So sometimes meta-communicating can help. And sometimes too, you know, being, if you have difficulty with different types of body language because you are interacting with people who use body language differently or and you're not sure what it means, you can also meta communicate about that. Sometimes, sometimes you can say, you know, I, I don't pick up on body language cues, but I'm so interested in this conversation. I'd love to ask about this, if that's okay. Or if you want to, again, like shift to a different mode of communication, you could say in the moment, is this something you'd be can I ask you about such and such? I would love to follow up by email or by, by text to ask you X, Y, Z. So those are some initial responses I have about shifting mode of communication, about meta communicating, about your preferences and about how people can meet you where you are as far as how, uh, your preferences and best means of communication. I see Grady with a hand up. I guess my question, I've I've done a few informational interviews, just trying to like explore different uh, possibilities, learn more about a particular field. Um, but there was one where it, it seemed like he kept trying to give me advice for how to get into the field. And really, I'm just trying to glean, is this the right fit for me? Um, and I tried, you know, redirect the conversation with different question types, but I'm wondering if you have um, any suggestions uh, kind of in that realm. Yeah, I hear you. I have I have a document about informational interviewing that I'm going to give out at the session on that, which has a portion in it about, you know, be, be positive yet vague, like don't oversell your interest in a specific field because sometimes people may take it further than you want and offer advice about getting my job, getting into my organization or advice that you don't necessarily want or ask for. So, so part of it can be, you know, the, the setup, the opening of the interview where you, you say, you know, I have a, a, a general interest in learning about X, Y, Z, but I'm very open-ended about what I'm seeking. So, I'm, I want to focus on your experience in X. So there, it might be in the setup to the interview, all the lead up to it, where you focus in on certain questions that you've already prepared and kind of set that menu of options for the interview. It might be in the very first moment where you're like, I, I really just want to get a sense of what this position is, but I, I'm open to other information about positions in your organization or other organizations in your field or et cetera. And then in, as somebody continues to say, join me, be me, be a product manager. You say, well, yeah, that's so interesting. I, I, I'm not sure if it fits my skill set. What could you tell me about project management? <laughs> See if you can pivot to another specific question. But I hear you. Sometimes it can be difficult to redirect people and your options if the, if continued redirection don't pay off could be simply to at the end of the interview use the question i tell everybody to, to ask which is knowing what you know about me and my interest in x who are two other people you might recommend i connect with and could i use your name 
So possibly if you again make that last ditch effort to say, this is where I really want to go. Who do you know who does that other thing? Could be that way to get two additional contacts and to follow those up and then see where that leads. So in that sense, an inter informational interview is never really a loss, even if somebody doesn't seem to speak directly to your interests or is too focused on bringing you into their their field that you want nothing to do with. So I, I would try that and I'll, I'll look up that document to uh, prime you for that, those questions and put it in the chat. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hey, Danielle. Hello, thank you so much for um, doing this. Um, I, kinda, I, get, I guess my question kind of overlap with the previous question. So I, I was wondering whether it is it would be better to reach out to like a wider group of people when networking or just like specifically go for what you are mostly interested in or like you're looking for. Because usually I found at a conference I needed to talk to really a lot of people and um, I kind of had this like utilitarian attitude. Like I was trying to make judgments about uh, who are more or like useful for job hunting for me. Um, but I think, um, cause like talking to a lot of people would make me, like it would be very energy consuming for an intro introvert. And, but um, on the other hand, you don't know whether this person that you're talking to is gonna be useful for you or not. So they, there may be potentials, right? Um, so I was just wondering like, but it's also like hard to navigate who are those people that would be interested in you and also how to find the people who are specifically in your field. So I want to wonder how to adjust this kind of mindset and how to, um, yeah, I guess that was my question. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. I am loving all of these questions. So one thing I would say about when you're in this moment of either virtual or in-person networking, and a lot of people are gathered in the same space, and it's just like, there's so many people who could potentially be useful or potentially you know, be helpful or teach me something, you may want to you know, divide your time. You don't have to come away with a huge number of contacts or pings or business cards or whatever. You can focus on, as an introvert, uh, your strength, which might be reaching out to one or two people for an in-depth conversation there in the moment. But then the key later is to follow up. And that's where, these patterns that I provided in the slides are so helpful because all you need in order to do that next follow-up, that next touch point is that shared experience. Even though you were there together and you didn't interact, you can say, you know, I, I loved, uh, I love the, you know, ACL conference, but I didn't get a chance to talk with you. And I was so interested to learn more about your work in why. So that can be that first, you know, LinkedIn message or that first email. However, you, you know, whatever channel of communication is provided to you or what you can find publicly and reference that shared experience, even though you didn't actually connect with them. So I do that first. And I, I would also keep, you know, uh, kind of an, an open mind about, you know, this uh, utilitarianism or utility of, of people. Uh, sometimes you just never know who is going to provide you a piece of advice or a story or teach you something that's going to be useful later. Uh, and that's really going to affect your growth. So, you know, stay, stay open-minded. It might not be exactly the, the people that you think they are. Uh, they could be the last people you might imagine um, who might be helpful. And they may not be also helpful in the moment. Um, there have been so many times when I have reached out to people I've met in the past to rekindle a connection and just learn more about how they've evolved and and you know how our paths you know now intersect in a way they didn't in the past. So so be open minded about judgments of utility of people, and you know do what you can in the moment. But then make use of these patterns to reach back out to people when you have time and you can sit down to craft something. You know back when you have energy when you're alone, you can craft those messages to follow up with people and introduce yourself. And I know we've, we're past time, so if people need to take a break, feel free to drop off. And but I'll keep answering questions as long as there are any. Yi Fang, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, so do you remember when you start uh doing networking? What is my big um weakness or burden for you to overcome later? Uh, when you do your network, start to do your network. 
what was the biggest what was the weakness weakness that I had to overcome to network because I I used to be very quiet I used to be the last person to raise my hand in a class and I was also labeled shy which a lot of introverts are labeled as when they're when they're young and perhaps later on so to get over the idea when I was young younger in undergrad say or early graduate school I had to get over the feeling of this person won't want to talk to me I'm bothering them as an introvert from the midwest part of the U.S. I don't like to bother people (laughs) but often I found that expressing some form of of gratitude is a wonderful way to connect with people and people don't receive enough gratitude. So when I have read an article or a book that has deeply touched me, I've taken the chance, which is a habit I've built up over time to reach out by email or like in the old days. Well, I've reached out by a number of communication channels to thank people for writing something, for putting something out in the world that I've responded to. Because people who are the writers, you know, if they're academics, they may not hear that a lot, but they're real people. And it means a lot to get a note that says, you know, your article about co-membership really affected me. And it really affected how I thought about immigration gatekeeping interviews. It helped me give advice to my parents who went through their immigration interview to get their permanent residency visa that I've remembered every single person who's reached out about something I've written. And I also recall as a way of investing in luck. Once I read a book on an airplane that moved me to tears, oh, airplanes and airports, always something happening. And I took the opportunity to reach out to that author, sent her a letter. Yeah, it was a letter and told her how much specific aspects of the book really resonated with me and how I appreciated the care of observation and and her perspectives on a a region of the world uh, that means a lot to me, Lebanon. And and I, I recall that I just sent that out there, not ever expecting a response, but she responded. And she picked up on something that we had in common, which was not only living in Lebanon, but also working for the Fulbright Association. And she said, I see you're in DC. Let's get together when I'm in DC. And maybe you can come with me, you know, and go visit our Congress members to talk to them about supporting Fulbright. I was like, what? I'm being asked to lobby by by somebody I just, you know, met as an author of a book. And it was the most fun experience. We had so much fun together, muddling through the halls of Congress and something that never would have happened if I hadn't reached out. But more than that, I I gained um, a really wonderful friendship with this author and something I truly treasure. So I think just taking that first step and and realizing that people will respond often to, to gratitude and people don't get that enough. People will respond often to interest in them. And you as an introvert can kind of use that to your advantage by showing your interest, your sincere interest in them and their work. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I know we have four minutes before the hour, so we should likely close recording. And I wanna thank everybody so much for being here. This is a wonderful group. I love seeing all these messages in the chat, which I'm gonna read later. And please reach out to me. Please look at the slides, ask me any questions. Uh, get to know me, get to know your fellow members of your cohort and of the registrants and of the linguists who have are spending time coming to this conference to share their experiences with you. You're all amazing. And I look forward to seeing you a lot over the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much.